and there we are. Welcome. Hi. Whoa. Hello. Hi, Doug. How are you? How can't complain. How about you? Pretty good. Yeah. In in this country, we say pretty good considering. Uh, right. And now, yeah. now let me introduce you, and then I'm going to let you uh, yeah. take over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Will everyone mute themselves but us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is well. There's lots. I, I yeah. now I'm going to try and find out who is talking. We all all good here. Um, Doug, will you unmute yourself? I'm going to introduce you while you unmute yourself. Doug, we're happy to welcome Doug Holder today. Who we'll tell you about right. Doug received a citation from the state of Massachusetts for his work as a publisher, poet, professor, and editor. And it's been written of him that he's a, a major league talent. And I want to just tell you a little bit about all those things that are, are quite quite amazing. Uh, that, that you know, I've been reading your your latest book, your collected poems, the essential Doug Holder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great name. Uh, the essential Doug Holder, new and selected poems. I and, yeah, my my publisher said that would be a good time. I didn't think so, but uh, and it came out during COVID, so you know, they said the essential workers and all this. I didn't know what the hell was. But anyway, <laughs> is it a great title? Uh, yeah. because, uh, it's like uh, uh, you know what you what's really important about you, because, right. because there is so much there is so much poetry that uh, that you've written. But and I don't know when you managed to to write it all because uh, here you have founded the Ibitson Street Press. And the uh, you're the arts editor of the the Somerville Times, and you're. You, I was going to go through all four of the different, uh, uh, the different hats you wear, and it's a, it's pretty amazing how many, uh, how many things you're doing all at once. The uh, the teaching writing, uh, I, I remember that you were a counselor for thirty years at at McLean's. Uh, uh, it's been a, a really uh, interesting experience as well uh, that you're going to talk about it maybe and and uh, for me this interview is going to be a cinch because you've interviewed so many poets and writers in, in programs like Poet to Poet and, and, and other programs that really uh, are, are wonderful you should all go on YouTube and look up Doug and you see all these different things, all these different things that really made me, made it very worthwhile for me to, uh, to, to invite you because now I can just sit back and relax and let you talk. <laughs> There's so much, you're so good as an interviewer that I could have you interview yourself, uh, and not make all, you know, all the wrong things. Let me, oh. start, let me start with one thing. Since we're coming from the Middle East, I'll tell you something about the poet, the writer, Nagib Makfuz, the uh -huh. Egyptian writer, who, uh, uh, whoa, excuse me. See, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, too many, uh, too many things coming in that are not, uh, uh, not part of this. So, the poet Nagib Makfuz. Writer, he never left Cairo, and he won the Nobel Prize. When you sit in Cairo, you see that there is so much to write about, so many people, I, and I see this in your work. That you know, there's so much you see, so much that that how could you leave? <laughs> there's so much to write about right where you are. Uh, would you like to tell us something about that? 
for the beginning. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I tell my students, I said, you really don't have to go to a, uh, a, a mountaintop in Tibet in order to get, you know, fodder for your poetry, you have some sort of uh, intense spiritual experience. Um, for me, I mean, someone, you know, Alan Kaufman, I don't know if you know him, he wrote Chew Boy and all that. Oh, he, yeah. he, 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 he said, I, my poetry reminds him of uh, Resnikov, who used to walk around the streets and, and uh, you know, re record, you know, common everyday day things. Um, and, so, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, well-traveled in any, any sense, but, I mean, there's a plethora of, of stuff to write about in my town of Somerville, which is right outside of uh, Boston and in Boston itself and the various places um you know that i've that i've lived i mean you know um something as simple as a hat means so much more than a hat i mean and you know uh, you know maybe it's your father's hat or you know it's your mother's hat or whatever and it has uh different aspects to it everything is connected so simple things i you know william carlos williams says no ideas but in things and you know what he meant was you know um you know take a thing and, you know, a solid, tangible thing and then create out, create out because everything is connected. So, I mean, I don't think, you know, my, my idea is, you know, a lot of people, beginning poets, um, think that, um, you know, um, you know, one must go to an exalted place or have an exalted experience. But um, I'm always, oh, you know, I always believe that, you know, everyday life. So my life, your life, everyone's life, right? is poetry but it's it's not just the life you focus on people which is what you do in everything you know you you, you organize people <laughs> you talk to people you write about people and your po poems are always about a single yeah a lot of them are uh i'm not like i say i'm not i, I love uh, people are very f fascinating to me um, you know, I'm not a particularly adventurous guy, um, but I love to hear about other people's adventures. And so, and actually I'm kind of shy, but if I go into the role of interviewer, then I, my shyness goes away. Um, but you know, um, you know, my brother is a big, you know, big time lighting designer and, you know, international lighting design he goes all over the world. He does all this and that is very adventurous, but for me. Um, you know, um, in the comfort of my home, I can interview, you know, you and other great poets and writers, Dara and all that, and um, learn a lot just by uh, sitting in my um, pedestrian seat here. That's now that we have Zoom, but before that, you, you still, you went around, you interviewed, you organized you brought people together to poetry readings, not just your own. You organized poetry readings. Uh, that's it's 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 as if all the different things you do come together in that one thing, people. Uh, one thing. Uh, <laughs> one thing. Well, you know, it, 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 you know, when I was starting out as a poet, you know, I, I um, you know, um, I, you know, I was occasionally getting something um, published, but I. I really wanted a community because I, you know, I always felt that, you know, a community is very important for whatever you do, especially, you know, in poetry as well. And um, so I started a magazine. How else to attract other poets than to start a magazine, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's sort of, it's sort of morphed <laughs> out of that. But before, you know, you know, especially, you know, uh, the American conception of poet was once was, you know, he's on the beach in some shack drinking booze and, and, you know, writing verse and, um, you know, all, you know, the, you know, the, the individual, but it's really not that way. I mean, it's like many aspects of life. You learn from other people, you get connections from other people. So for me, um, um, uh, community was just a natural step from being the singular poet to, and, and I mean, it's not as it was a lifestyle, you know, the lifestyle also was greatly improved by that. So it becomes a living, you know, organic thing. It's, uh, you know, so I have many friends who have developed over the years 
and um, um, you know, uh, en enrich my life, I would say, by doing that. Yeah. And you've helped in their development. And there's well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's um, you know, um, you know, some people I have helped. I, I get th I get thanks from people, uh, you know, and um, that's always very nice and you know so you see people who are just starting out now they you know they're they're um you know major poets or whatever um yeah i mean that of course is a gratifying but i i, I you know character study as you pointed out is uh, is a big deal for me um because i'm always looking at people and i'm always trying to figure out what they're about so you know anyone in the street is uh you know open game um I worked in a mental hospital for 37 years and I've written, I've written a lot about some of the clients in the mental hospital, McLean hospital, which if you're not familiar with is where your son lives in Belmont, Massachusetts. And um, in fact, one of our, um, uh, uh, one of our Celia's here, Celia Merlin, who uh, I, I know her sister and I, and Celia was here at the voices of Israel um, and um, Celia's sister worked at McLean. I don't know if she still does. I'm retired myself, but um, she um, hello. What was it? What's that? Perry says hello. Yeah, is she still working? She's yeah. not necessarily at McLean's, but she's got her private practice. Wonderful. <laughs> and she's so anyway, uh, I know she's good, good woman, and. Uh, and um, so what was I saying? So I worked in the mental hospital with, uh, and I've, I've seen things that a lot of people in this wouldn't, wouldn't see in the ordinary life. Raw, you know, raw images, uh, people who have been through the ringer. I see, I've seen, I've spoken to people who were suicidal and they might've been a, um, a, a, you know, a corporate titan and uh you know but they were if they show their vulnerability they're they're ruined in business i've seen you know people who are you know um uh, who are trying to regain their youth and they're sort of addled by medications uh grown women holding um um uh, you know little stuffed bears uh, you know um just for, you know when they're sleeping just for security at night um um, you know, um, and so these people, fast, the, oh, these people as well as other people have always fascinated me. But being on a locked ward, you know, when I used to run poetry groups and things like that, you were there with them every day, you know, and um, so you, you get to know them and the rhythms. Yeah. Some, some of your poems are really about individual patients uh, or specific maybe you'd like to read a few uh oh you... all right sure yeah. yeah sure let me just i should have brought my little oh, we... will you excuse me for I, a minute i here? can lend you my copy uh <laughs> <laughs> hold on for one moment uh, i think we're gonna, at this point moment we're going to stop the recording uh, but uh uh, I'm sure that you all have questions, and you'll have questions. And maybe after you know half an hour or so, uh, we'll open it up totally for questions. Yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll get some of my um, patient poems here. Hold on. The one about three o'clock in the morning is the one that you like that one. For some reason, that one speaks to me. Uh, let me see All if I of can them. Find it. Uh, All right, hold on for a minute. The, the the patient poems are, are like where there there's no defense. They stu the the people have just oh have totally opened up mm -hmm. situation, and I thought that they're very unusual. Mm -hmm. And now I can't find them. Uh, It's near the beginning. The beginning. Oh yes, here we are. Thank you. You, you know it better than me. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Let's see. Yes, here we go. Let's see. I put you on the spot here. 
uh, yeah, no, I um, but there's cigarette a on the psych cigarette on the psychiatric that's cigarette on the psychiatric ward. Um, that's is, a good is, 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 is a is a poem, so I could read that. Okay, uh, let's just see here. Can I have a light? What was a sudden spark in her eyes? That flame from cloudy dormant pupils when I lit her cigarette. The sudden driving ambition to inhale. The sunken chest's almost beautiful, almost boastful expansion. The smoke filling the yawning cavity. A woman of substance until she exhaled. Oh, cigarettes were used to be, and they, I don't know to what extent they were, but I mean, people smoked on the wards and, um, you know, um, all over the place, you know, and um, so, um, and they were, you know, people really craved them. I think they gave them some relief from what they were going through. Um, let's see another one from yeah. the, the ward. Uh, first night on the psychiatric ward. Yeah, I remember starting there back in 1978 um, or something around there. Um, and um, and this was the first night I was um, on the psychiatric ward and a patient thought that I was, he had made me, he, I, I, he was God and that he had made me. So this was my first experience with a psychiatric patient. Um, first night on the psychiatric ward. The night seemed perfectly cast, stormy, thunder and rain. The patient was biblical, long haired and a beard with a staff at his command. He put a paternal hand on me and called me his finest creation. What could I do but thank him? He smiled with divine patronization. Undoubtedly, I was a much valued acolyte. Then suddenly a flash from the storm lit the building in a momentary spectral glow, a clasp of thunder howled down the lock ward. He looked at me like a proud teacher, patting me on the back. Good work, kid. Good work. So, yeah, those were two two poems from the ward. Um, but um, yeah, you. Priceless. Your, your, um, your connection is not great. Yeah, you don't hear me now. No, we hear you. Okay. Uh, you would you like to read some more, or would you like to talk about the uh, the other poems? Because uh, yeah, I'm yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, there was a period in my life um um well i lost um i had a lot of losses in the in the last um in the last few years my my wife died um and of ovarian cancer and my mother died um so i I've, I've, I've written poems um about them and um here's one about my mother when she was dying um well, she wasn't dying, but she was in her 90s, and, you know, um, she wasn't doing that well. So it, it's called, um, no, actually, it was when she was dying. I'm sorry. So it's called Where Is My Pocketbook? I lived enough. I've done it all. She clutches her potch pocketbook, a weathered bag to a weathered face. Now it's resting on her deflated breasts. This is unfair, I want to die. The light dims and evening surrenders. She screams shrilly at the institutional walls. Where's my pocketbook? I give it to her. She rifles through the plastic promise of credit cards, the crumbled receipts, the scrapes of scraps of paper with deceased phone numbers and the faded stamp of errant lipstick. Her fingers move like an arthritic snake and search for a flimsy thread to hold on. Why must I suffer? Let me go. Where is my pocketbook? Where is my pocketbook? So, you know, it, it, it's very poignant to see her 
you know, sort of like giving up and saying, let me go. But then again, still yearning for the connection, the pocketbook. And uh, I've had a lot of women of, um, of my, 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 my mother's age who really, um, and maybe younger who, who could relate to that. Um, but um, let's see something else. Women who and, cling to their pocketbooks, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> well, I mean, this was one with my wife. Um, not about her dying necessarily. Um, and it's called We Hold Pans. At dusk, we hold hands. We hold hands with facing tarnished rings. As if some unexpected storm can suddenly separate us forever. We listen to the muted horn, the hint of some heroin tainted voice. We clink our cocktails, the house cat, another appendage between us. And the light grows dimmer as it always does. Um, let's see what we have here. You know, it's interesting just to talk a bit about my background. You might be interested in that. Very um, much. Yeah, you know, because uh, um, my 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 grand my my uh, grandparents uh, and people of their ilk um, came over from um, Russia. You know, from the Pale of Settlement and you know pogroms and all that stuff was common story. And they all moved. A lot of them moved to the Lower East Side, um, and my 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 great uncle Henry Kirschenbaum was a um they started out as book peddlers in the Lower East Side. I remember, you know, he he was telling me about the Lower East Side. I said, uh, I, I said, did you ever meet George Gershwin? He says, Yeah, he was a good kid. <laughs> and uh like um, you know, uh who's the Mar Murray Dance Studios, uh Alfred Murray or something like that, whatever. You know, it's just these people who were there and the Lower East Side was amazing. But anyway, they he was selling Kirschenbaum was selling books and his brothers were selling books on push carts. And eventually, um, um, you know, um, it morphed into the Carnegie bookstore in New York city, which was a very famous used bookstore. My brother, my Henry became a huge, um, a huge bookseller, um, and, you know, rare, um, you know, rare dealer in books, you know, he's, he assessed the library of T.S. Eliot. He told me that, um, um, he told me that, um, you know, like he would get a lot of uh, prominent industrial industrialists, corporate people, and they were book lovers. The husbands were book lovers, bibliophiles. And the wives would often say one more book, you're out of here. So it would go, they would, you know, they would go, um, and they would go to my uncle and he, you know, he'd get them, he, he, he'd get them placed in university libraries and things like that. But he was a very practical man. I mean, um, which was interesting. Is he, you know, he was a businessman and um, book was more of a commodity than, I mean, he wasn't, a, you know, he was a very bright guy, but I don't think he was particularly liter literate. I mean, you know, well, you know, analytic about literature and things. I said to him, why did you get into books? And he says, I had to make a living, you know, and, um, and, and, he, and uh, so, um, you know, he was very straightforward about it. Um, but, you know, he was till I could remember, you know, till he died when he was 96, he would, they had a little plaque for him. And um, I think it was the, the table in the Waldorf Astoria or something like that. We, we threw him a birthday because he, he, he would eat lunch there every every day. He was a creature of habit. And uh, I remember the last time I saw him, he came in with his Hamburg hat, you know, something out of a Singer novel or something like that. And he was, he would, uh, he, you know, he would, we'd all stand up. He'd sit down at his place at the table and, um, you know, very old world um, and I regret, you know, at the time I was just a young kid, but I, you know, I regret that I didn't record conversations with him. I, I think I felt too intimidated because, you know, he had that presence about him. But I mean, I think we were always surrounded by books. You know, we got all kinds of rare editions and things of that nature. So it became part of um, my sensibility. Um, and, um, you know, we, it all comes from somewhere, doesn't it? 
you know. And my father was a PR man. He was a madman in the 19, if you know what a madman is, 1950s. And um, so I have that tendency to promote things. You know what I mean? He was involved in newspapers and, and um, you know, he's a very charming man, just like me. <laughs> a little humor there. But um, uh, and he was, you know, and he knew how to, you know, talk to people and get things in the newspaper. And, um, you know, it was interesting because in kindergarten, um, we all wrote little things about my father's a policeman. He, you know, helps people. When my father's a fireman, he puts out a fire. And I wrote, my father's an advertising man. He goes to cocktail parties. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, what that is. But, um, but you know, and, and my mother was very much um, into the arts also. And um, so, um, you know, and my brother is a three-time Tony Award winning lighting designer. He started out with the Lion King. And I think it was the exposure. My mother kept, you know, we had a little John F. Kennedy, you know, suits, you know, with the hat and the, Thing and she would take us into the Leonard Bernstein's Young People, uh, Young People's concerts and the opera, uh, the uh, you know the opera, uh, you know. Um, so she, you know, we I don't know how happy we were listening to the opera, but she took us anyway. And um, um, so you know, it's all about you know your 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 upbringing, and um, you know I I think it was you know it's affected profoundly, even though I didn't know it at the time, but. Uh, these figures. And then when I went on to graduate school, I was searching for my uncle in a way. And I came across Henry Roth. And um, I did a, my thesis on Henry Roth, food in the fiction of Henry Roth. Oh. And, and, and my teacher was a very prominent Yiddish literature person, her name uh, Weiss. Uh, Ruth. W, uh, Ruth Weiss. Do you know who I mean? You must Ruth know. I mean, she's a major... She worked on the world of our fathers and, and all these things like that. So she said, I brought her. I said, look, I want to do food in the fiction of Henry Roth, traces assimilation by the food he eats, right? She says, well, you know, this sounds kind of trivial, um, you know, the food. Well, we know food is very important now. but um, And so I did it. And she says, well, you proved me wrong. So I took from a kid who was, grew up in this very, you know, people came over from, from you know, Poland, Eastern Europe. And he's trying to assimilate in the culture. Eventually, in the end, he dramatically throws a stinking salami sandwich into the Hudson River and has a nice ham sandwich with his goyish friends, right? And uh, so I traced it through the whole thing. And it's amazing what you can, you can do through food. But I was looking. I was looking. And, I, and there, I mean, you know, you know when you're onto something. It's because you're crying. Because, you know, when you read this, it's so touching to you. And I, I was became, you know, you become enmeshed in this and the music of Yiddish, even though I didn't know Yiddish. You know, my parents, knew, I guess they knew it. My parents, parents talked in Yiddish and they would understand it, you know, and, or they would talk uh, when they would want us to understand something. But, um, but I, you know, I got into this. And I was actually exploring, you know, the, you know my own past and I was trying to, um, um, uh, you know, uh, um, under, you know, have some understanding of myself. So it was a, it was an amazing process. And, um, so that's that on that. Yeah. That's, that, that's a, an amazing subject for, uh, uh, for, for a thesis. And, and you write about food too, don't you? Oh, yeah, I always liked food. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I've written about gefilte fish. I've written about uh, hot dogs. I've written about uh, kishka. I've written about all kinds of foods. I mean, I'm not I'm not a fancy eater or anything, you know, but um, uh, I, 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 for me, the best time for me is we are with friends. We get together for dinner, talk. You don't have the goddamn cell phones on, you know, and you just, you know, something, there's a, a bonding about it. And, you know, dinner, you know, I don't know anymore in modern households, but dinner, you know, I'm sure you all know, is, was an important time. You stopped everything, you got together, you sat down, you know, all together and ate. And, ate. and um, 
and I think that tradition, you know, there's a good reason for that. I mean, you know, you know, to keep the familial bonds and all that, and um, and the food was a way to, um, you know, you, you know, I had the typical grandmother who would say, "Eat, s my kin, s my kin," you know, he should always want me to eat something, and uh, she prepare these huge meals. Uh, and it was a form of love, uh, feed, nurture. So, um, especially when you come from from pogrom world uh, and where right. there's no food and when you finally get it, you want to give it to everyone. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, my, I would, you know, I'm not a religious Jew, but um, I was very much a cultural Jew. I mean, I grew up with that. Um, well, uh, and a lot of my Jew, huh? a gastronomical Jew. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The cultural. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that's my, uh, that's some of my background. So it's books, you know, my interest in Judaism, um, my character character studies, uh, and so I started, I started the magazine, and then that morphed, and I started interviewing people on a cable show. Uh, then I someone or I took over the Newton Free Library series, which is a pretty prominent series here, and. And then I just started writing for the newspaper in my city of Somerville. Um, and, you know, I have a poetry column. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I traveled to Israel a while ago, Vo Voices of Israel. Um, and I went from, you know, it was an amazing experience for me. Because here people were saying, no offense, but people were saying to me, you know, when you, when you get to Israel, you'll, um, you'll kiss the you know, floor at Tel Aviv. So when I'm going around Israel, you know, it's, oh, yeah, by the way, a missile just, you know, hit here, you know, at this point and, you know, checkpoints. And then I was on a bus and all these kids had machine guns. They were, you know, troops. So I, I tell people, I kiss, you know, I was, um, you know, I was amazed on, you know, how strong Israeli folks were compared to us Americans. Um, and I said, I'll tell you what, I kissed the ground in Logan Airport in Boston when I got <laughs> home because I was, it was such a. You know, it was such a, um, you know, I never, and that, you know, now, now it's more and more like Israel here in this country. That was before nine eleven and all that stuff. So, um, but you know, I th that was a great experience also, um, and um, yeah. So, yeah, I've I, so I've done all these things, I've, uh, and you know, and uh, you know, I've done them on my own mostly, um, the you know. You establish things. I mean, you, yeah, you establish things, yeah. Uh, presses. You, uh, you establish a reading, a reading series, a interview series. I mean, these are uh, these are things like when you miss something, you just do it. You make it. Uh, you make it happen. Well, you know, yeah. The the bagel bars actually came about, which is a group of people who meet every Saturday, poets and writers, playwrights, um, and. Uh, because I was watching a Woody Allen movie where the comedians would meet at Zabar's or something like that. And they would talk shop or they would talk about their lives. And that's exactly, I said, I, I want to start something like that, you know, and, um, you know, you know, you know, people talking all over, you know, you know, eating, talking, you know, all that stuff. And, and a lot came out of that, you know, we had anthologies and things like that, but uh, yeah, throughout, as you see, you see that line of, of um community and and it was if it wasn't for the people i met i you know i'd be sending out a poem here and there and uh you know that would be it um but and and i you know i just wouldn't know about all all these different things and um have all these different experiences that i had you I, know i was there once i once i yeah. went with you to the bagel book uh, and it and it the whole concept of first of all we for some reason, it, we we have never had that work here, but because people don't have any sp a specific day when they can get away, and they're not, you know, like if we have Saturday, but you're not free on Saturday because there's no public transportation, and uh, and if you're religious, you don't travel, so we don't do that. So we we don't have a day where we can all meet. Just you know, as as you as you put together but it seemed so, like such a fertile place 
uh, oh yeah, uh, and and humorous like just like yeah. just like Woody Allen, <laughs> right, right. There's all kinds of characters in there, and that what makes it special to me. And it's a place where I still go after 20 years. You know, we started at a finagle a bagel in Harvard Square, and now it's in North Cambridge. But um, uh, you know. And not everyone eats bagels. I have a bagel every day. <laughs> it says you don't have to eat bagels, you know. Um, and it's great community. I've made many friends. I mean, just, you know, when my wife was dying of cancer, you know, people came over and helped me and, uh, you know, raised money. I mean, it was, it's amazing. Sorry. And, uh, and uh, you know, the literary stuff that came out of it, you know. So what can I say? You know, literature's not only made, you know, you know, literature has not only made, uh, you know, my life interesting, it's, it's just created a life, you know, it created a life. Amazing. Can I open this up to um, sure. people in this group so who will probably yeah. barrage you with questions that I, sh I should have asked before? Uh, no. And they're all, almost as nice as the people in the bagel bar. Good. So why don't you if, unmute yourself if you have a question? Um, I'm sure that everyone here is wants to uh, send send to you their condolences. Of, yeah, that was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And you have a cat, Kletzma. Yep, <laughs> Kletzma the cat. He's a great cat. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so if you have a question, I'll just unmute yourself and, and uh, Mike, you can start uh, asking. Okay. Uh, it's actually a double question. Uh, I ultimately uh, want to ask uh, Doug to uh, read us a, a poem that he wrote about uh, food, but uh, I wanted to, uh, first, I know that you wrote a book, Karen, uh, about uh, food talking to you the food at home yes and uh, i i thought that uh, maybe if you had a poem handy that you could read about food it might be interesting the counterpoint uh between uh, between the two but uh if you're if you're not prepared for it i'd like to you know i'm i'm sure you dug that you wrote about food yeah and, yeah you know, i'd like to hear how how you make it uh you know your your take on it how you make it poetic Oh, how how do you make? I mean, it's like how you would make anything poetic. I mean, yeah, um, that's true. You're right. I mean, I mean, I know. You know, like I say, I start with things. Uh, you know, not yeah. a can of beans in the street can be poetic. It's how you imagery and um, you know line breaks or whatever or the music. Um, so I don't think food is. I don't think food is any uh, exception. No, I, it's it's obvious to me that it's uh, that it's you that uh, uh, makes it poetic. And, uh, but I, but, but, but I, I, I do for you. I have a hot dog poem. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Love to hear it. And, and this was my my late uncle, Cy Baum, who was dying, and um, his last request. You know, he's a Bronx kid. You know, he used to go to Yankee Stadium all that, and his last request was um, for a hot dog. Okay. Wow. The la and it's called the last hot dog. Long after he was hungry, it was the last thing he asked for with any appetite. So she brought it to his sick bed. He bit through the red casing, the familiar orgasm of juice hitting the roof of his mouth and some facsimile of his youth. Bites of memory, the summer ballparks, the steam rising from the carts and warm, fragrant clouds against the shock of early spring cold, the mysterious dark and delicatessens under the elevated tracks, the Bronx gray afternoons dining with his father, the sullen, colorless meals, though the franks fully garnished, the bright yellow and green of mustard and relish. He swallowed hard. It was all too much to digest. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Well, you know, Freud, Freud said sometimes a cigar is not a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes yeah. a hot dog is not, you know. Uh, yeah. A hot dog is not a hot dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Could I ask I, something? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. First of all, I remember Doug when you came to the voices, you were judge of the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember oh, when wow. you came. <laughs> oh wow. Um, yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I want to ask you, um, at what age did you start writing poetry? At what age did you know you wanted to be a poet? You know, I have, it's interesting that you ask that. Uh, I have a book out a few years ago. It's called um, um, Portrait of an, of an Artist as a Young Poseur. <laughs> and... And, and it's because I think, you know, I started out like, you know, I was putting beret on and I was, I thought it was a tragic character, you know, a little, little thing around my neck and uh, I was posturing, posturing as a poet um, and living, you know, living in Boston, posturing as this tragic poet. And, um, and I think I did, as you start doing it so long, you become what you posture at, I think, a lot. And uh, for some reason, I picked a posture about that. And uh, I, you know, I knew I, I had the sense that I was a poet. You know, I was keeping little journals and snippets of writing that I liked for many years. And, you know, even back, back in the 70s when I was living in a rooming house in Boston right after college. Um, and I can't tell you what I, I just... I uh, I just viewed the world as 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 be if you can believe it as beautifully tragic, and um, and um, I I I couldn't stand the uh, the banality, you know. I not that I I just couldn't believe that the world would be just so banal. There's there's, there's all this stuff going on behind it, and people tend to put you know put it away or don't stop to look at it. So I, I knew instinctively that I, I wanted to um, um, I wanted to do that, uh, and so you know I didn't really you know I'm I'm 68 now, but I, I didn't publish my first poem till I was uh, 36. But I was writing um, poetry and and sort of preparing to be a poet, you know, not consciously, but just by keeping these journals, writing, reflecting. Uh, putting in small poems and things like that. Um, but um, it just seemed natural for me. I mean, it's just the, the way my mind, my mind went. I mean, I could have been an accountant, nothing wrong with an accountant, but you know, I don't have, I, I it's just for some reason, it, even though it seemed impractical, my parents were worried, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, go to law school and uh, you, know, go, you know, be a doctor and all this stuff. But it wasn't for me. So I, I and um, I did what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, my brother, for instance, you know, he had a good job in business. But, you know, but he was also a, a lighting designer. He quit his job in business and went for a very low paid position in the, in the arts. And now he now he became a, um, an artist, you know, lighting design, Lion King and all that stuff. Um, Wow. So I guess it's just something runs in our blood. I mean, there was a lot of artists in our family, you know, and, uh, you know, guys who drifted around. I guess you would call them Luftmensch, uh, someone who drifts, drifts around and dabbles in this and just sort of. And so, yeah, you know, I, I, I haven't, you know, I've um, I haven't I've lived, I guess I could say, a bohemian life my, my whole life. Most of my peers are, you know, ensconced in the suburbs with kids and that's great and all that i sort of just live like a you know me and my wife we we live like a perpetual graduate students um and you know um of course i wish i had a house now, the way right everything's rising and everything but uh you know i get by and i'm i you know i do what i want you know and so your poetry is your profession so, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I teach to make a living. I was working in a mental hospital for many years. I, you know, I was always working. I was working, you know, three jobs at times. So, you know, it's not like I was, like, uh, you know, you know, just saying I'm too pure to work. I had to work. I had to make a living, as my uncle said. Um, but I would always, but, you know, I think I chose jobs, like when I was a mental health worker and things like that, where, you know, you didn't bring home a lot of work. You know, you went to you had to work hard, but you didn't bring home a lot of work. And, um, you know, um, 
in a place like McLean provided some tuition help and I was going to Harvard at night. And, uh, and, and so I would work all day and then go to night school and, um, um, and, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was just, you know, at first I was posturing, but then it became part of me. Like I said, yeah. can I ask something? Okay. Yeah. First, um, uh, you're so modest and nobody mentioned your work with the university of Buffalo. Oh, yes. Well, you grew up in Buffalo. I know you yeah, and your sister. I went to the university there. And you worked on the library there. There's a whole... Can you maybe explain a little bit more about what, what you did with the University of Buffalo Library? It's well, I mean, I didn't do, so to speak, do that. They have a Doug Holder paper collection there where a lot of my tapes and, and, uh, and, and, and um, tapes of poets and correspondence with other poets are, are housed there. Um, I, I was invaluable. very good friends. It's invaluable. That library in the University of Buffalo is invaluable. Mm -hmm. um, they have a small press and rare books collection. Michael Basinski used to run it. Um, and I, you know, I met him and he says, yeah, what take poetry books? I, I, I would think the most complete collection of our poetry books and things are, are at the University of Buffalo. And by the way, if you have poetry books, they'll very, be very interested for you to, to to um, have in their collection. So, but I mean, they did, I, you know, they did say, you know, I said to them, look, I've been doing this for all the stuff I've collected. I got to get it out of the house and, uh, you know, how about a collection? And, you know, and they said, sure, you know, and um, so, yeah, yeah, Buffalo, you know, um, so Buffalo is a great, is a, is a, is a great literary community. Very nice. I, I and I know Karen to... went to, was that? Oh, go on. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I, a different topic that you mentioned with loss. And uh, I'm wondering, because many of us are going through different periods of loss, parents, uh, especially in Israel now. Um, right. Did you, do you find that you turn to writing to help you with loss? Or is it something that is bigger than you and you just have to do it? And does it help you? The, one one last thing, because you mentioned crying. After you write a poem with loss, do you have uh, the feeling of, oh, I needed to say that? Thanks, I needed that. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Sort of, um, um, all I know is, uh, well, for instance, when my mother died, uh, my mother died. Um, I was thinking about it. It was churning in my head. And so suddenly I sort of got into this sort of um, davening motion, mother, mother, mother. And, um, and, um, um, and from there, you know, um, the poem, you know, came out about my mother, 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 mother. Um, and um, I think, I mean, I don't, I, I don't go about writing poetry for it to be cathartic. But um, when you're, you're, when you're in that poetic high or whatever, you're in that poetic run. Um, something mystical about it, you know, so something mm -hmm. uh, you know that you can't explain, nor do you want to explain. Um, right. You just want to go with it. Yeah. Yes. I have a question, also, Karen. Yes, go ahead. Please jump in. Okay. Um, thanks. It's been such an interesting conversation. Doug, I really appreciate your focus uh, in your poetry on the everyday, on the particular, on the moment. And my question is this. Um, can you talk to us about how to elevate those particulars so that the effect is more resonant, is more universal? Particulars of... of like well, uh, whatever the particulars are, whether it's a person or a moment, etc. But okay. to be able to elevate that or, or have it resonate so that you know it's not locked just into that moment, that it touches other people who are reading it, that it it, it connects. Because right. you know, sometimes when you read material that's very particular, it's just locked into that frame and it doesn't resonate out. So my question yeah. is just to talk about it. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, you know, poetry is an art, right? It is yeah. an art, uh, you know, um, and some people are going to, you know, be able to resonate better than others. So like I say, you know, it's not like, I mean, you can learn poetry and be a competent poet, I think. Um, I, 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 I mean, I really think, I think you have to live a little also. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you really, I mean, because, I mean, there are, you know, like, what it was, Keats was like 16 or something. So, but I mean, you know, um, <laughs> you really got to be able, uh, I mean, I don't think I was really writing maturely until I was at least in my 40s, at least. So, um, I mean, you have to mm -hmm. have some life experience. And I, I think because that gives you the empathy. Um, yeah. I, all I can say is that, uh, although, you know, you still, I mean, I'm not stopping young poets or anything like that. I'm, I, I'm just giving you my personal thing on this. I mean, a lot of yeah. just great young yeah. poets out there. But, uh, but what I was saying was, um, you know, for instance, I, I was sitting in Harvard Square at a Starbucks, and I just noticed this guy next to me had a lottery ticket. And he sort of looked like he's gone to see, seen better times. And so I'm looking at this. So it's just a simple lottery ticket. And he's scratch, scratching at it furiously, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, and so I'm saying, what's this, you know, what, what's this guy's life about? You know, he's, you know, yeah. it says his last chance, you know, or something like that. He's trying to get out of the squalor. He goes to the bathroom he, and then he comes back or wherever he goes, he comes back with another, you know, uh, another lottery tickets, you know. I said, you know, this this guy, this guy is only scratching at the surface, you know, yeah. um, and um, literally, so, yeah, literally scratching at the surface. So, I mean, I, I, I th you know, you you really got to intensely, uh, uh, you know, concentrate, you know, um, I mean, you see that image, you know, I could walk around for months and not have that image, but if it hits you, it resonates. Hmm. Then you go back to it and think intensely about it mm -hmm. and play and play with words and um, mm -hmm. read it out loud to your partner or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. It's that you know. intensity. It's that yeah. intensity that you yeah. have to yeah. tra transmit when you, you have to feel it very deeply. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so that's why it's hard to say, how does one do it? But like anything, you want to have a passion about what you write, and it, that naturally comes through. You know, I, I had a kid. I said, look, "Tell my kids, you know, when I was teaching composition, you want to you want to write something you're passionate about." So a kid comes up, and um, you know, because then you then you'll write well, you know. And the kid comes up, wants to write about nail care, you know. Well, you know, you know. I said, "Are you that much into nail care?" I mean, is that this? he says, "Yes, I'm into nail care." So the next thing she brings the the essay in and it's about well ladies before that date you got to get the cuticles right you know and uh, it was you know it was plagiarized from a how-to thing but my point being is that i think the best way is just yeah you have a passion for something i can't write on demand like joey's bar mitzvah you know or yeah. something like that you know it's i mm -hmm. think if i if i have a passion for something and it's based on your your unique sensibility you know mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'd like to ask yeah, you something. Yeah. You, oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you you have contact with young people, and I'd like to know um, how do you feel about the, what the writing today? Do you feel a big gap between your generation uh, and what people yeah. are writing today? Does, does it resonate with you the way the poetry of your contemporaries? Well, well you know as. Um... Billy Wilson sang in uh, uh, what was what was the movie again? No, Casablanca. It's still the same old story. Um, the um, this they're still writing about love and death and all that good stuff. You know, I mean, well, you know, it's good in the sense that it's all part of life. Um, they, you know, when when I went to college in the seventies, uh, you know, uh, we read books, you know, um, and now they're more um reading a book is is not like it was when i was a kid um and uh that using you know a lot of digital stuff um i think i i i you know because i teach a lot of novice poets I, i've never taught grad school or anything like that nor would i want to 
But, um, you know, one thing I tell the kids is, you know, because when they start out, they want to they write very politely, you know, you know. And I said, look, if you're going to write and they're, fr they're frightened, you know, they're frightened to write, you know, they want to be a good kid and all this stuff. Um, not like Alan Kaufman, my pal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, that, so I said, look, if, if you're writing about you know, mom in her gingham dress and you're going down to the, uh, the the creek and then coming back for oatmeal cookies. I mean, you know, you're not really bleeding at all. You're not bleeding. You're not having the conflict. So what I try to get them to do is to, again, the passion, to try to get them to write about something that reveals something about them that, um, you know, I mean, in all kinds of writing that I teach, I said, you know, there's not, you know, not everyone is, a beautiful blonde and a broad shouldered male. I mean, there are bald guys, you know, all the guys with beards and stuff like that. You do, not everyone's perfect. You have to embrace the flaws or it's going to sound phony. And, um, and I think that's the challenge, you know, to get them, you know, from away, you know, away from what feels comfortable to get out of, you know, and not unreasonably so, but to get out of their, their um, comfort zone. But, you know, kids, Kids are kids. I mean, what we, what we, you know, and um, I, I mean, I think they have, uh, you know, the same themes that we've, that we've, we've, de we dealt with when we were kids. It's just, um, it's a different environment now, you know. So, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I would not say these kids today, they don't know anything, you know. I mean, they were, you know, uh, because they were doing that to me when I was a kid. Uh, I, no, they're, they're, they're bright kids. They, they have a different world than we grew up in, and they have different ways of, uh, 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 you know, gaining information and things like that. So I, I think kids are great, and they do the best they can, and it's a very confusing world out there, you know. Can I ask Adam, can I? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hillel and then, and then Steve, okay? Okay. Yeah. Hey. Hillel. Yes. Okay. So you mentioned Yankee Stadium. Yeah. And I'm a transplanted Brooklynite in Tel Aviv. Of course, Yankee Stadium was the hated Yankee Stadium. And I was wondering if you've written any um, baseball poems. You're now in the Boston area. And the, basically the question of American themes, which baseball is one of them. Glad that you asked that. I did when uh, the six, I was in. I was like fourteen, and I was a mar. I was, I was the. Uh, um, I, I I was just crazy about the New York Mets, the Miracle Mets, and and I and I wrote a poem about Shea Stadium. Um, and um, I mean, I was. Uh, I mean, talk about passion. And then I thought, why, you know, there's got to be a deeper reason behind the passion. And I think I was, and I was 14 or 15, 16, whatever, what was 1969? I was only, what am I, 1969. So I was like 14 years old and I'm very confused about the world. I still am. <laughs> Things haven't changed, but, um, but uh, baseball seemed to provide an order you know this first base second you do this right first base second base, third base you know they had the young rookies the old guys you know it, it, it and they were you know they were all respected in their own right it sort of made sense of the chaos of the world oh. it, was, it was it was structured um and um it also you know also it was tradition my my father he, he saw Babe Ruth and he was in the Bronx. He saw Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig and all that. And he I remember he told me I was such a Yankees fan, uh, Yankees fan um, that I remember throwing a radio out of, outside my tenement w window when they lost or something like that. So and it, it's just uh, uh, it, it's just a metaphor for life, like a lot of things are. Yeah. Uh, we have a whole list of questions. Uh, Stephen, then Judy, and there may be more. So uh, I'm going to just move things along. Steve, hi, Doug. Um, I'm a, hi. I'm I'm a Boston guy. I grew up. Oh, there. are you? Yeah, yeah, and taught in Vermont, and uh, 
And I just want, had one question. Did you ever know old man Grolier in the Grolier bookshop? Oh, I mean, Carney, Andrew Carney? Car yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Carney, right, yeah. No, I didn't. I, 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 I didn't know him. But I know people who did, and I knew um, very well. Um, uh, now I can't remember her name. The woman who ran it after him, uh, Louise Solano. So, um, yeah, and um, but I heard he was he was quite a character, and um, he, right. you know he just a pile of books right up and uh, you know in a pile, and um, he could be cranky, and uh, um, hmm. he was um, it was a place to be, you know, people would come in there or great. Poets I, I used to I used to live there after oh, graduating uh, uh, college and pretending I was a grad student at Harvard going in and out of classes. I'd wind <laughs> up in the Gralia's bookshop and he eventually granted me a, you know, a, uh, a but it, it, I, I forgot what he called it. What? what? He gave you a, a plaque. No, he gave me a, an account. A, a, oh, you know, credit, credit, credit. <laughs> credit count. But but you, you never had to pay, you know. And I I met a lot of incredible poets there. But I was just wondering and um and uh, well actually uh this woman um friend of mine who I met, um Olivia Huang, uh she did a she did a um documentary that I was in, which is a talking head, about the Girl Your Poetry bookshop. Yes. Um it's um the world's I can't remember the title of it, but her name is Olivia Hong, if H U A N G, if you wanted to look up her documentary. Um, and uh, uh, at the time, the, after Louisa Solano died, it was, it was um, the Grolier was given to uh, Ifyani Menkidi, who was a professor of philosophy at Wellesley. He took it over and he died, and now the family runs it. It's still there. And, um, oh. you know, oh. and it's, yeah, it's still thriving, you know, and they have readings there all the time. And oh, that that's stuff. good. Oh, yeah. I just I was curious and uh, I miss Boston, especially in yeah. these days. But uh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You did. You had a question. <laughs> yes. Um, I I looked at a number of things. First of all, thank you very much for the things you have been saying and you said and I looked at um, a number in, number of things you have done and uh, and then I looked at the Ibbotson Street Press um, requirements for poetry and and I found it very interesting and I just wanted to ask you what's your take on it uh, it says I'm reading now uh, we look for poetry that is not too abstract we look for simplicity, economy of words, that's quite clear for me, something that speaks to all of us. The poetry should have layers of meaning and be strongly situated in the everyday. Now, of course, that, in my view, there is a little bit of contradiction here, but, <laughs> but why would you why would you say that? How do you think about poetry if you say that we don't want it to be too abstract? You know, that would certainly exclude Hafez, Rumi, Baudelaire, Mallarmé, Naili, uh, <laughs> easily Sutzkever. And then I want to connect this to another very interesting thing. I heard an interview with uh, Jacques Brel. With who? Johnson writer. Yeah. The Belgian, uh, French. Okay. Johnson writer. And he was very much against uh, this new trend. Oh that students are analyzing his songs as poetry. And he said, I'm not writing poetry, I'm writing song texts. And the difference is that poetry is abstract and it works with metaphors. And the song text is immediate. Well, Bob Dylan what won the Nobel. What is your take on all, all, all this? Well, Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize in literature. He's a songwriter, so for, for <laughs> I, him, I so, know. You know yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, well, you can win the Nobel right. Prize with anything, yeah. but <laughs> but um, but um, what do I mean? Is is that too much to ask? And that's no, I mean, uh, 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 what do I mean? I, 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 oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Someone wanted to say something, 
I, I wasn't. I wasn't no, okay. Wait, I, you know, everyone has their own. You. Let me unmute you. Uh, everyone. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. But, but. But you have muted yourself, so we. I see someone talking, but I don't. Uh, I, I. But she's muted, so you have a, a silent question. Ah, yeah. oh, here no, I'm I'm unmuted. Unmuted. now. Oh, you're unmuted. Yes. Yes. And uh, I have a question. I first of I, all, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't finish the question with the uh, other lady. Okay. So, yeah. It's only because I I bought in like that before it goes away again. It keeps well, going away. So all right. Oh, well, I'll keep uh, I mean, I wanted to answer the question by the other the, the lady there, and then I can come to you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, right. Abstract. We, um, we all have our styles. There are the language school poets and things like that. Uh, when I mean too abstract, I mean, I don't like poetry that is, you know, it, that you can't grab onto something like a jury Graham, great poet, but it's not my style. Um, you know, you see what my work is like. It's, it's as an economy of words, each word I hope counts. Um, this is me. This is my style. It's my magazine. This is what I'm looking for. Oh, there are always poets who are going to be excluded. Um, you know, it's just the nature of, of the beast. But in, in when I'm asking, you know, but basically, you know, I, I try, you know, I wrote that a long time ago. You know, Auden said a poet works, a poem works for him when it makes him cut himself while shaving. Um, and that's basically the deal. You were sending me a poem, you know, he said, this is an abstraction. I, I suddenly, but I see, you know, tangible images and, I, and it's affecting me emotionally. And I cut myself while I'm shaving. That's a good poem. I know it when I see it. And that's Doug Holder. And, you know, people don't like my poetry. A lot of people don't like my poetry. They might say it's too simplistic or it's too, you know, um, bare boned. And others think it's great. So, I mean, my magazine is sort of, uh, you're right. My magazine is my sense. Of, it, it has, I started it with my sensibility. And that's my sensibility in, in wow. poetries. So that's, oh, that's I, I wasn't say. asking that. I was just yeah. really asking what what you really mean by abstract in poetry. I I wasn't. Do you have to ask such difficult questions? <laughs> yes, I know. Basically, <laughs> uh, I was asking. Yeah. Because um, to me, many things in your poetry is abstract. So I, I'm asking this question. Then, how do you define? something right. that's that's as a I mean I, 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 or I don't know I, it's hard to define it um I but to me if I can't if I can't you see it gets back to me again if I I can't give you the definition that you want but for me if I can't is there something there that I can't grab on that's something tangible and it's just words that you know and and there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason um and um, for me, that's that's too abstract. But I mean, you know, that's a broad, you know, I mean, metaphors don't have to be particularly, you know, I mean, I love metaphor. I'm not saying I don't like metaphor or all the symbolism and all this stuff, of course. But, you know, um, we're almost finished. Yeah. Can I know? Can I know? I'm off. Please. Yes, it's you may it's speak. It's yes, it's I it's hope it's I answered your question, but I, I know I sort of. Um, you know. But the, first of all, I enjoy so much the, the conversation and listening to you. But secondly, I have a question here. I have here in a page. It's seventy-eight, uh, number seventy-eight. It says it's from a, a publication. You gave it uh, this poem to me years and years ago. And we and I wrote it down uh, that you even uh, won a, a, a Ruben Rose um, a prize, and it's by Doc Holder, and it has a five unfortunate unfortunate uh, uh, um, title, but you you hold your horses and I didn't I didn't write it. Dig up my dying dick. Rise rise up my dying dick. 
Do you remember a thing like that? No, <laughs> I am no? sorry. Okay. No. okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I think I have it here, and uh, you uh, you wrote it to me. Um, and uh, what is it called again? Uh, rise up, my dying dick. My dying who? Dick. Dick. You mean like a dick? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, that's certainly a, a worthy poem, but I uh, I don't remember writing it. Maybe I have it. Maybe I, I, have it for, I have it for years, and I I saw my I saw my I saw <laughs> my. I don't remember writing that. Um, you know, I don't have many Schwanz poems. I think but, it was uh, to yeah. Richard Nixon. It was Richard to Richard in honor of Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if it gives um, you. If it gives you happiness, I applaud yeah, it. I, I don't care. I didn't write it. I, I saw this opportunity to to ask you face. To I don't. I don't remember. It's possible that I did. Um, okay. Yeah. You know, okay. It's possible. Thank you. I don't remember. I'm not sure it disappear again because it flickers on on and off. I don't know why, but no. that said somewhere that my horse. On um, mutes me, but uh, it's don't not... worry about it. I mean, like the long lost works of Doug Holder, you know. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I can't keep you anymore. All uh, right, uh, I hear a lot of uh, interesting and and uh, and uh, uh, things, and uh, I, I, I say take it in. I know You're good I, for you, that's good. I, yeah, and some uh, the, the uh, mental um, remark. And uh, thank you. Well, I'm thank you. Thank you for your for your work. And yeah, that's a line we'll never forget. And yeah. uh, <laughs> um, Anne has a question. Yeah, and I think yeah, that will be our okay. Final. Okay, hi, hi. I hi. have a tech, I have a technical question. You know, you spoke before about writing things that you feel passionate passionately about. But there is also this school of thought that says that you have to prime the pump, that you have to get up every morning at four in the morning and sit down at your desk and write whether you feel like writing or not. And, you know, do you have any opinions about that? You know, no, do I don't, you, do I don't you, believe do you. Do you I don't, that I, thing? I, I don't. Um, ah. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, get up and say, if there are people who do it and it works for them, you know, everyone has their own method. You know, mm -hmm. I have to have something come to me and then I know I want to write about it. But, um, you know, I am actually up very early in the morning because I'm grading papers. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Um, but not necessarily to write poetry. I think, you know, if you, you know, it, it, you have to find your own method. For instance, I love writing and I love writing in coffee shops. Um, oh, my cats. Uh, I like I like I like writing in, in coffee shops and. Um, for some reason, the ambient noise and whatever is uh, is um, helpful, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, whatever whatever gets you through the night, is my saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I I tried to. I, I just add. I tried homo, which is where you have to join everyone and write a poem every day for a month. Yeah. I tried it. I almost had a nervous breakdown. Uh, right. So, you yeah, know, I mean, exactly the kind of thing that that uh, turns me off. I mean, it turns my poetry off. And I, I, I wonder, Doug, maybe that's uh, that's the way it is for you. Uh, um, uh, I, I can't write that way. That's just me. But I know people who it works for very well. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I don't have to feel guilty. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I thank you, and Doug. I think we I think we've worn you out. Uh, no, I'm always. It's a pleasure. It's a. It, 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 we've enjoyed it very much. I'd love to have you back. Uh, but I really thought that you you have so much to give, and you give so much that that we really needed to uh, to hear about all the things that you do. And well, I appreciate so, the opportunity. Yeah, um, I appreciate the opportunity. And and we do too, so I hope you, we will see you again soon. Uh, I think that we have uh, exhausted your the uh, the questions, and uh, I'm so glad that we had this uh, this chance to talk. 
uh, there's so much that is that that you uh, you kind of encourage, you bring up. I'm sure that everyone's going to come up, come back to me and say, "Why don't we do?" <laughs> uh, please read more. Please read. Please read before you leave us. Please read something else. He did yeah, Michael? He read a few poems, uh, and and maybe uh, Doug, would you like to read uh, uh, some of your? Yeah, sure. Hey, right, listen. That's great. I, you know, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. You, you know, you don't think of yourself with these uh, perspectives, you know, but when people are asking you questions about your life and things like that, you know, you get, you, you sort of gain a different perspective, you know, and things like that. You know what I mean? Um, it, it just by something, but um, all right, let's see. Um, okay. Well, I talked to you about how I like, I, I read a lot about urban things and um, I'm attracted to people and different things. Uh, so this poem is, I don't know why. I don't know why I have visions of elevated tracks, subways defiantly roaring at the dark, damaged men pawning costume jewelry for cheap redemption, legless men on wheeled carts. Can you spare a fin? After all, he was a former choir boy. The patrician slap of the old gray lady on the pavement outside the newsstand. A sign on a city street. Sig Klein's fat man shop. Men in black overcoats. Clandestine girth hidden beneath their draping body armor. The sliding shot glass over the polished wood. Monk straight no chaser in the background. The summer street. A kid throws his radio out of a Bronx tenement window. The Yankees went south in the tent. A man at Ratner's who life has been reduced to yelling at a round-shouldered waiter. You call that a pickle? The neon's ironic wink and his sound and fury must, all the sound and fury must signify something. That bring, you know, that's an interesting thing about Ratner's because I was living on Long Island. You know, my parents were from the Bronx. But it was sort of like, you know, fascinating old world. And I had a friend of mine who was old world, kind of Brooklyn guy, and he'd bring us kids to Ratner's. And he, he had, the, I guess he had this ritual in Ratner's. The guy would, you know, put out the onion rolls and put out uh, the pickles. And my friend's father said to him, you call these pickles? You call these pickles? And they would get into this sort of... <laughs> The argument, and I imagine that it went on for years, like just this, this sort of, uh, you know, ritual between the uh, waiter and the, and the, um, and the, uh... well, here's a final one about my mother. Um, actually, you know, my mother um, and I had our problems over the years, you know, strained and. Um, Where are you? I, huh? Where are you? He's here. He's here. He's behind his book. Oh, I'm behind my book here. I'm trying to. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find that um, poem, but now it's sort of, um, uh, it's sort of a little. Um. Yeah. So anyway, my mother and I, you know, and I'm sure as mothers, you know, you have your good and bad times with kids, and um, you know, um, but toward the end of her life, um. You know, I tried to, you know, we connected better. I tried to connect better with her. And so I was on a train uh, going from my brother's house um, in up, upstate New York to uh, Manhattan. And uh, my, I was sitting with my mother and um, she said, oh, don't, she said, it's cold. I'm depressed. I'm old. I held her hand. Oh, don't, she said, it's cold. She said, maybe I pushed too much. Maybe I gave in much too soon. Perhaps it was something I needed to be told. I held her hand. Oh, don't, she said. It's cold. I said, but we love you. One was once bought, now has been so long sold. I held her hand. Oh, don't, she said. It's cold. She said, what should I have seen? What was I meant to be? What would have pleasured me? I held her hand. Too bad, she said. It's warm now. 
but oh so old. Her hand gently broke from me, and like spotted moths, fluttered free. That's my, my, my mother. Yeah. Wow. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the for this these beautiful poems. Thank you for for uh, asking for it, Michael, because we were about we're going to sign off now, and uh -huh. uh, and it uh, it's wonderful to see you all. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank we'll you. And I'm going to go read your poetry. Much. And <laughs> we'll see you again. And and we'll, I'm sure that everyone's going to come by it on Kindle the except. We'll meet again, right? As the song we'll goes. Meet again, yes. Okay. Don't know where. Okay. Don't know when. I'll meet you in in in, uh, in Boston. All right, I look forward to that. See you then. Okay. Hi, Ricky. Good night. Hi, Ricky. Ricky, Ricky. Ricky please say hi. Who's saying hi? Boy. It's me, Pierre Gates.